Good evening, everyone. Um, from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, I'm Dr. Al Baptin. I'll be chairing this uh, session. Thank you for joining us today and the 10th Saturday night uh, SSVMT lecture series by uh, National Guard Hospital. Today we have two lectures uh, about multiple myeloma, an exciting time for multiple myeloma community as uh, new drugs and treatment strategies are emerging. Um, uh, the first lecture will be addressing the, uh, the treatment of uh, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. The second lecture will be addressing the strategies uh, and management of relapse refractory multiple myeloma. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Philippe Moreau. Uh, the, uh, he's a professor of clinical hematology and the head of uh, translational research program at the University of Nantes, France. Um, uh, professor Moreau has a his focused interest in multiple myeloma treatment. Um, uh, he is uh, the chair of the uh, famous uh, IFM group, as well as the uh, vice president of the uh, International Myeloma Society, as well as a member of the Myeloma International Myeloma Working Group. Uh, neither to say that he served uh, as a principal investigator of and co-PI of many famous international uh, randomized phase three trials like Tourmaline, Aspire, Endeavor, Arrow, and, and much more like the Cassopia, the famous Cassopia clinical trial. Um, he has an outstanding prolific scientific publication record, uh, more than 300 peer review articles and highly impact uh, journals like the Lancet the New England Journal of Medicine. He also uh, is a, um, he received the uh, 2018 Robert Kyle uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Please um, uh, uh, join me to um, um, in this lecture. Uh, before we start this lecture, I'd like you uh, to mute your uh, microphones for the moderators. Um, I'd like, before we start, to thank our uh, sponsors, uh, Novartis and Takeda, Professor Moreau, uh, um, Thank you for joining us today. Please, you may start. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, may I have the first slide? Yes. So uh, I would like to discuss with you today uh, about the frontline treatment for patients with the uh, newly uh, diagnosed uh, multiple myeloma. And you can see here my uh, disclosures. And uh, we are going, first of all, to speak about uh, the treatment, the frontline treatment for those patients that are not eligible for uh, stem cell transplantation. And uh, as you know, uh, these are the uh, European ESMO guidelines published in 2017. Those guidelines will be uh, updated uh, by the end of the year. And as you can see, when patients are not eligible for stem cell transplantation, we are proposing, we were proposing a third option, either VMP, or Lendex or VRD. So why those options? VMP was established based on the VISTA study uh, uh, with uh, more than 340 uh, patients uh, treated in the VMP arm of the comparison VMP versus MP. And the median PFS uh, into the study uh, was uh, 24 months with a median overall survival of 56 months. Uh, the first study uh, established uh, Lendex as a, a standard of care until progression. And this is based on the uh, more than 500 patients treated. And the median PFS in the Lendex continuous arm of the study was 26 months. And the median overall survival uh, was uh, 59 months. Uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Brian Dury published uh, in fact, uh, in uh, the Lancet uh, in 2017, uh, the results of the uh, SWOG 77 study uh, comparing Lendex until progression uh, versus VRD eight cycles followed by Lendex until progression as well uh, on a quite large number of patients with a primary endpoint of a progression-free survival. And uh, he showed uh, that uh, 
for patients older than 65 years. Uh, into the study, uh, patient population uh, enrolled uh, was uh, not only elderly, but also uh, young patients. But if you are focusing on uh, elderly patients, 91 elderly patients, the median uh, PFS was 34 months and the median overall survival uh, was uh, 55 months. So uh, the study was recently updated a few days ago in Blood Cancer Journal. And you can see that with a longer follow-up uh, in patients older than 65 years of age, there is only a trend for a better overall survival that is not statistically significant when comparing VRD uh, versus uh, Lendex. More recently, uh, Dr. Um, Mateos published in the New England Journal of Medicine the results of the Alcione study. And Alcione did compare prospectively VMP, same schedule according to the VISTA study, versus VMP plus uh, daratumumab. And uh, she uh, was able to demonstrate that DARA on top of VMP was able to improve progression-free survival. But uh, importantly, into the study, as you can see, DARA was also proposed following DARA VMP, following the quadruplet induction, nine cycles until progression. And the progression-free survival is highly improved. You can see here the hazard ratio that is really in favor of the uh, quadruplet combination. The median PFS uh, is 34 uh, months, 36 months uh, versus 19 uh, in uh, the uh, uh, VMP arm of the study. The study was updated recently uh, in uh, uh, the Lancet, and we ha now have uh, data regarding overall survival. The PFS benefit of DARA VMP translated into an OS benefit um, and uh, with a median follow-up of 40 months, you see here uh, the benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.6 in favor of DARA VMP. This is now the uh, first combination uh, with DARA Tumumab as part of frontline treatment showing an overall survival uh, benefit. So I have here summarized the results of Alcione. You see uh, the median PFS, 36 months, and uh, overall survival at 42 months, 75% of the patients are alive. But definitely the best uh, option, to my opinion, for patients with relapsed myeloma is DRD. Uh, this is based on Maya. Maya is a prospective comparison in uh, patients not eligible for stem cell transplantation of the conventional Lendex versus Lendex plus Daratumumab. In the two arms of the study, the drugs were proposed until progression with progression-free survival as a primary endpoint. And the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019 by Dr. Facon. And you see that uh, the uh, control arm, the Lendex arm, is a very good one because the median PFS is 31.9 months, the best results reported with Lendex. But if you are adding Dara to Mumab on top of Lendex, you are really improving, highly improving, the progression-free survival with the hazard ratio of 0.56 in favor uh, of uh, the uh, uh, triplet combination. So a 44% reduction in the risk of death or progression with the addition of daratumumab. So I put here uh, the results of Maya that, to my opinion, are the best ever reported for elderly patients. Uh, the overall survival uh, data are not mature because the follow-up is too short. We need a longer follow-up to see if the PFS benefit is translating into an overall survival benefit. But we can expect to have a median PFS uh, based on the hazard ratio of more than 50 months in the DRD arm of the study. And keep in mind that currently, 50-month P median PFS is what we are reaching with stem cell transplantation in younger patients. So definitely an outstanding study. Uh, and uh, when we are looking at patients older than 75 years of age into the Maya study, and 44% of the patients were older than 75, you see the same benefit, the same magnitude of benefit based on the hazard ratio. So it means that DRD is also highly feasible in very elderly patients. Uh, 
Uh, and that's a very, very important point for the future. So based on Maya, uh, DRD is now approved by FDA, by EMA. And I have here summarized, uh, this is the overview of the uh, median PFS in recent phase three trials. You have here uh, in blue, the VMP based uh, results uh, with uh, the VMP arm of Divista of Alcione. And you have here the VMP DARA that is also approved by FDA and EMA. You have here in red the Lendex results, and you see that with Lendex over time, we have improved on the outcome and the median PFS of the uh, Lendex arm of Maya here with 30 uh, more, almost 32 month median PFS. And here in orange, you have the VRD results and the best results with DRD uh, that will uh, probably change really uh, the way of treating elderly patients. So uh, definitely, I think that we are going to change the guidelines in the near future. And uh, the first option for elderly patients will become either VMP DARA based on Alcione, DRD, Lendex DARA Tumumab based on Maya, and VRD. And Lendex and VMP will be downgraded into second options in the future. Let's speak now about the treatment of patients that are eligible for stem cell transplantation. And according to the uh, European guidelines, we are proposing a systematic frontline stem cell transplantation when patients are eligible for stem cell transplantation following a triplet induction with a maintenance using lenalidomide until progression for patients less than 66 years of age or fit patients uh, up to the age of 70 years when they are in good clinical condition. And this frontline uh, high-dose treatment is standard of care based uh, on two trials, the IFM 2009 and the EMN02 study. So this is the EMN02 study that was very recently uh, published by Dr. Cavo a few weeks ago. Patients receive an induction with VCD and were randomized to no stem cell transplantation and VMP, or a single or a tandem stem cell transplantation. And definitely when you are looking at, oops, sorry, the progression-free survival, this PFS was into the EMNO2 study uh, with a long follow-up of more than five years. The median PFS was uh, with stem cell transplantation uh, 56 months and was only 42 months uh, without stem cell transplantation. So a 14 month difference in favor of uh, frontline stem cell transplantation. The second study is the IFM 2009 uh, prospective comparison of VRD versus VRD plus stem cell transplantation followed by maintenance, one year maintenance in the two arm of the study. And we also showed that with uh, uh, VRD and stem cell transplantation, the median PFS was 50 months, 5-0, and 36 months only with VRD alone. And the difference is exactly identical, 14 months, to that of the uh, EMN02 study. Uh, importantly, we looked at uh, minimal residual disease into the study, and when patients were able to reach MRD negativity, here in blue, the overall survival was improved as compared with MRD uh, positive patients. And the best way to achieve MRD negativity is to use stem cell transplantation frontline. So definitely this is a strategy, induction, stem cell transplantation and maintenance. And uh, uh, the role of induction is very uh, important. We need to have a fast control of the disease. If possible, achieve MRD negativity uh, with minimal toxicity uh, to allow an adequate stem cell harvest so that the patient will be able to proceed uh, to uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, we are proposing a triplet induction uh, based on bortezomib BEX plus a third agent, but we have very few head-to-head uh, -head comparison of triplets. Uh, into this French study, we did compare Cyborg D, VCD, versus bortezomib thalidomide index, the combination of a proteasome inhibitor and an imid, and we were able to show that the responses are significantly improved with VTD uh, versus VCD, although with VCD we also have very high responses, 
but the safety profile is different. With uh, VTD, we have a higher rate of peripheral neuropathy, and with VTD, uh, with VCD, sorry, we have a higher rate of uh, hematologic toxicity. But why not switching from uh, both is, uh, from thalidomide to lenalidomide with the VRD regimen? And recently, the Spanish group looked at VRD six cycles uh, before stem cell transplantation, showing very high uh, VGPR rates of at least 66%. So the same cooperative group looked previously at six VTD uh, before stem cell transplantation, and they showed also recently an integrated analysis of uh, those two trials, one looking at VTD in red, followed by stem cell transplantation, and the other one, 6VRD in blue, followed by stem cell transplantation. And they showed that the responses rate, the response rates were higher with VRD, and that's translated into a better progression-free survival at one year and two years. So definitely, VRD will become standard of care in many countries, but one way of improving on the results uh, uh, is also to uh, add a monoclonal antibody uh, to the triplet. And that's what we did into the Cassiope study. We used VTD four cycles before and two cycles after stem cell transplantation versus the same regimen plus daratumumab. And when uh, looking uh, at uh, the uh, uh, quality of the response, the depth of the response, in fact, oops, sorry, When we looked at the efficacy in terms of response, you see that the response rate are higher in the DARA arm of the study, and the responses are deepening over time after induction, after stem cell transplantation, after consolidation, and the responses are better with DARA tumumab, a quadruplet combination instead of a triplet combination. The primary endpoint uh, of the study was the stringent CR rate uh, before maintenance. And this stringent CR8 was highly improved with the addition of daratumumab. And we also looked at MRD negativity before maintenance. And with Dara, the quadruplet, 62% of the patients were able to reach MRD negativity versus 43% of the patients with VTD alone. So definitely a depth of response that is much higher uh, with uh, daratumumab. And this translated into a better progression-free survival. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, hazard ratio is 0.47 with DARA, VTD, and stem cell transplantation. Uh, so that is representing a 53% reduction in the risk of progression or death uh, with the quadruplet combination. Uh, we uh, uh, also have already a trend for a better overall survival uh, with the quadruplet combination, although the data are not mature because the follow-up is too short. But keep in mind that the rate of uh, uh, survival at two years in the DARA arm of the study is really outstanding. 97% of the patients are alive uh, with the quadruplet combination. So why not using VRD plus DARA tumumab instead of VTD plus DARA? VTD plus DARA was approved based on the results of Cassiope, but uh, into this uh, ongoing Perseus uh, study, we are prospectively comparing VRD versus VRD plus daratumumab in the setting of stem cell transplantation, and we are awaiting for those uh, results. Uh, what about mortality during induction? I, I put here some uh, uh, data on very recent trials with VCD induction, VRD, VTD, or VTD-DARA. And you see definitely that on a very high number of patients, the mortality rate is definitely very, very low, less than 1.5%. And what about stem cell harvest? Over time, when looking at VAD, uh, VD, or now triplet combination, uh, we have a reduction in the number of the median CD34 positive stem cells. This is also true with quadruplet combination. We have to uh, increase the use of plerixaphor, but nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, there is always an adequate stem cell harvest. 
But what about tandem stem cell transplantation? What is the role of tandem stem cell transplantation? Uh, into the EMNO2 study, uh, Dr. Cavo looked in the intensive arm at the comparison of single versus tandem. And he showed very nicely that not only PFS, but also overall survival was significantly improved with tandem stem cell transplantation versus single. And that was especially true for those patients with a high risk disease. So definitely now in Europe, in many centers, we are using tandem stem cell transplantation for patients with high risk disease. Uh, what about maintenance? I told you that lenalidomide is standard of care and uh, with uh, len maintenance uh, versus uh, no maintenance, we are improving overall survival in this meta-analysis on 1,200 patients. Uh, so LEN is approved, is reimbursed, and is standard of care. But in the future, potentially, we are going to use other types of maintenance. We had recently the results of the Tourmalin MM3 study looking at Ixazomib maintenance versus placebo with a PFS benefit in favor of Ixa uh, oral proteasome inhibitor, but the benefit is not as important. Uh, it is marginal, to my opinion, of five months. But why not combining uh, ixazomib with lenalidomide? And currently, uh, the Spanish study is looking at following stem cell transplantation at len maintenance versus len plus ixazomib, and we are awaiting for those results. Into the Cassiope study, we are also uh, looking at daratumumab maintenance uh, after consolidations. Patients are randomized to no maintenance versus dara two years every two months. And definitely the landscape of maintenance will change in the future. And to conclude, this is my last slide. I showed you what are going to be the guidelines potentially uh, in 2020 or 2021 we are going to propose to our patients a quadruplet induction, including a CD38 antibody, tandem stem cell transplantation for high-risk patients, and definitely uh, LEN or LEN plus ICSA, LEN or LEN plus daratumumab maintenance in the future. And I thank you for your very kind attention. Thank you, Professor Mobo, for the very interesting talk. Uh, with lots of new information. We barely can catch up on the multiple myeloma world, but thanks to you and the other experts and our colleagues, uh, we need these lectures for this matter. So um, we'll um, postpone the questions to, till the end. We'll move on right now to the second part of the uh, webinar. Uh, it's gonna be um, a lecture about uh, the relapse refractory uh, setting how to treat multiple myeloma, uh, focusing on the real world evidence. Um, the uh, speaker is Dr. Ayman Jazzy. He's the consultant and section head of ad adult hematology and stem cell transplantation and the department of King Abdulaziz Medical City in Riyadh. He's a, um, an assistant professor in hematology and oncology in King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences, Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Ayman, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, please uh, go ahead and start your uh, lecture. Thank you, Abdul Wahab, uh, I will, uh, uh, for the nice introduction. I would like to uh, thank the uh, Saudi Society of Blood and Marrow Transplant for uh, organizing uh, these nice uh, webinars. I would like to thank the KIDA for their support. So my role is uh, to talk about the uh, management of relapse refractory multiple myeloma which is probably uh, 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 more complicated than the first line treatment. Uh, so first of all, uh, um, uh, when we consider somebody to be treated uh, for uh, uh, upon relapse, there are multiple factors that we need to consider. Uh, and these factors are either disease related, treatment related or patient related. The most important disease-related factors are the type and risk uh, status of the disease, presence of refractory disease, uh, and the aggressiveness of the relapse. Uh, for the treatment-related, it depends on what regimen the patient was on and uh, what he relapsed on, uh, and the duration of remission the patient got uh, from uh, the first-line therapy. 
uh, the patient-related factors mainly are a focus on how much that patient can tolerate and uh, sometimes the preference of the patient when there are options. The goals of treatment as usual um, to maximize the response and delay the uh, or prevent disease progression and the most important of which is uh, to balance efficacy with tolerability and uh, focusing on quality of life for these patients in addition to prolonging survival. <clears throat> This is a, a, a retrospective study in uh, around 5,000 patients done in Europe, looking at mainly how many of the patients, when we encountered them for the first time, how many of them will be eligible for first line, second line, third line, and fourth line. And as you can see here, about 95% of the patients are actually eligible for first line treatment. 61% for second line, 38%, and only 15% can reach fourth line or even 1% in the fifth line. So that slide probably uh, focuses on if you have a, the best regimen, probably you need to use your best regimen upfront rather than waiting for a subsequent line to use different regimens in, uh, in, in order to get uh, prolonged uh, progression-free survival. <clears throat> uh, so we'll go ahead with the uh, uh, main trials that have uh, looked at uh, different regimens in the relapse refractory setting. Uh, these are the RD-based uh, uh, regimens uh, that uh, have uh, uh, looked at the uh, relapsed refractory setting, the KRD, IRD, DARA-RD, and LORD with the hazard ratios as uh, shown here. I'll just try to use the uh, uh, arrow. Uh, where is the arrow pointer? Okay, I, I hope you can see my pointer. But uh, this is uh, the KRD, the ASPIRE trial, where uh, they looked at KRD versus RD. And in all the subsequent trials, I mean, the RD base, they have the RD as a comparator arm. So KRD was given up to 18 cycles and uh, continued uh, RD until progression. So in that trial, the progression-free survival was uh, 26.1 months in the KRD arm versus 16.6 months in the RD arm. So that uh, uh, was uh, an option. The uh, second trial I'm going to talk about is the uh, Tomaline MM1, which used IRD versus RD again. Uh, but this is a unique trial in which the, it's a double blind and it's placebo controlled. And it's the only trial uh, that used this type of setting in the relapse refractory setting uh, where, where RD backbone is used. Uh, so um, uh, I'm trying uh, the navigation. Uh, the, so in the IRD arm, 20.6 months PFS versus 14.7 PFS. Uh, so this is a triplet that is better than RD again. Um, the next uh, trial is the Polex trial, where daratumumab, an anti-CD38, was first tried in the relapse refractory setting in, the phase, in a phase 3 trial, um, uh, where it was compared to RD uh, and until progression. And this is the uh, three-year follow-up of the trial with a hazard ratio of uh, uh, 0.44 giving us a median PFS of 44.5 months for DARA-RD versus 17.5 months for the RD arm. So the RD arm gives us about 16 to 17 months uh, in most of the trials that have used RD as a comparator arm. Um, these are uh, uh, the, uh, I don't know, we have skipped the eloquent, which used the LORD as, I don't know why, but that's fine. Something wrong with the navigation, probably. Anyhow, uh, ELO-RD, ELO-TUZUMAB uh, is uh, an, an anti-Islamf7 that uh, has been added to RD and has given a modest increment in PFS of about four months. Um, uh, just a word that 
elotizumab alone does not have, I mean, significant efficacy in multiple myeloma, but when it was combined with RD, it did make difference. And over, over time, that difference persisted. Um, uh, these are the comparisons between the trials in terms of overall survival BGPRCR and duration of remission, which was 28.6 months for the Aspire. Here it was 40 months and uh, 20 months, 0.5 in the tomaline MM1 using IRD and 20.7 months for the ALORD. Um, now we have presented what the trials have shown us uh, when uh, these patients were included as part of these trials. Um, so if we talk about real world evidence where we have patients that have not been treated according to the trial parameters, as we know, most of the, uh, I mean, patients, only 40% of myeloma patients actually can fit the inclusion criteria of clinical trials and 60% don't. So real world evidence shows better probably um, uh, uh, although uh, based on the evidence scale, it's uh, less than the randomized controlled trials, but it shows most where all patients that you see in the clinic could be included in that uh, sort of evidence. Um, Ajay uh, uh, Carey uh, from New York has uh, looked at this and looked at the outcome of patients who are eligible to RCTs and those who are not eligible. And clearly, those who are eligible for RCTs were doing better as compared to those who were not eligible uh, and excluded from trials. So this tells you uh, that uh, real-world evidence is good to look at when you have trials that are well designed but still exclude many patients. Um, this uh, uh, study uh, looked at real world evidence by the same guy, Ajay uh, Carey, uh, um, looking at three different regimens, uh, more or less uh, similar to what we have seen in the uh, uh, control trials. IRD, KRD, and VRD in the relapse refractory setting. Uh, this table summarizes the characteristics of these patients. And whenever you see a green uh, that is uh, in favor of the trial, of the uh, combination regimen, and when it's blue, when it's yellow, it's uh, an adverse event for the combination regimen. So comparing these three regimens in real world evidence, um, uh, as you see, um, I mean, in the VRD arm, most of the patients were actually in the second line, while in the IRD were equally distributed. In the KRD, 50% were in the second line. Uh, both uh, uh, EMEDs and uh, proteasome inhibitors were used in about 60 to 70 percent in the IRD and KRD uh, uh, patients, uh, but only in 32 percent in the uh, uh, VRD uh, patients. So uh, looking at duration of therapy as a surrogate marker of PFS, because most patients would be put on, um, uh, although that is uh, not the exact uh, uh, PFS, but IRD was uh, used for uh, an average of 12.3 months as compared to KRD, which was only 7.2 months, and VRD 10 months. So these numbers are really different from what we see in the trial. They are much less, or, but when we compare uh, 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 triplets, um, probably IRD because of the ease and less side effects um, has been used uh, uh, for a longer period of time as compared to the other triplets. And this is the same uh, results for these uh, triplets uh, showing that uh, proteasome triplet, uh, this is from EHA uh, by Debes, and uh, they looked at huge number of patients using different triplets um, in real world, and uh, whether uh, they have used uh, uh, portezumab triplet, uh, carfilzomab triplet, which is the C, daratumumab triplet, or ixazomab triplet. 
and uh, comparing uh, these uh, triplets uh, uh, all together. And uh, as you can see here, the duration of treatment uh, based on uh, these triplets is shown here, and time to next treatment is shown in bars here. And as you can see, again, the IRD is probably used uh, more as duration of treatment uh, until the next line of treatment as compared to even Dara triplet, Carthosumab triplet, or Bortezumab triplet. Um, the um, next uh, um, is uh, a study uh, published by Terpus recently uh, that uh, he looked at uh, uh, patients who were treated with uh, IRD in Greek, uh, Czech, and UK databases. Uh, uh, total number of patients was 155. Uh, the median age was 68. And you can see the overall response rates here. Uh, and the median PFS was 27.6 months. As you remember, in the tourmaline MM1, it was 20.6 months. And the uh, discontinuation uh, rate was nine months in the real world as compared to the tourmaline, which was 17 uh, percent. To the contrary of what we expect when we use uh, uh, other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, when we compare real-world evidence to clinical trials. Here in the linalidomide exposed patients, as you know, I mean, most of these trials that have used RD as backbone, only about 15% or up to maximum 20% of patients have already used either in the Pollux, the Tomaline, the Aspire, and the Eloquent, uh, only about 15% of the patients have already used lenalidomide uh, as first line, but most of the patients did, were lenalidomide naive, which does not really represent what we see in real life. Now, most patients, or, or it, almost all patients, use lenalidomide up front, and these, the results of these trials cannot be replicated in those patients. So, even with that, those patients who relapse while on maintenance, as we see here, uh, this is a Canadian study that looked at those who progressed on lenalidomide based maintenance, uh, and um, uh, the, the main uh, uh, treatment was either carfilzomab-based, daratumumab-based, exazomab, or others, pomalidomide, lenalidomide, or bortezomab. As you can see here, the median uh, PFS was, uh, I mean, for the data, it did not show really what we have seen in the Pollux, which is understandable um, basically because of the uh, uh, Reblimid that has not been uh, commonly used as first line in the Pollux. But to the contrary, exazomib based did well as compared to the other regimens which we uh, uh, saw in the uh, clinical trials. So done with the RD-based uh, regimens that we can use in the relapsed refractory setting, which I believe are not the most appealing now because most patients would probably relapse on a uh, Revlimid-based uh, regimen or at least on uh, replement maintenance post auto transplant if they were transplant eligible. Sorry. Um, okay. So the first trial is the endivore. Uh, Philip Moreau knows this, and uh, this was uh, uh, the uh, Demopolis uh, uh, as PI here, uh, published in Lansing in 2015. Um, so looking at KD versus VD um, and uh, the uh, in the relapsed refractory setting. And you can see here the median PFS for KD was eight, 17 to 18 months, and in the uh, VD arm was 9.4 months. So something to use, uh, patients are learned by refractory probably. Uh, the Castor study looked at DVD, and you can compare these results to an EMED-based or an EMED-addition triplet, which are 
really, uh, I mean, less duration of uh, progression-free survival as compared to the RD regimens, which we have seen uh, just uh, uh, a while ago. So in the Castor study, DVD was compared to VD, and this uh, uh, showed improvement in PFS. Uh, again, 16.7 uh, uh, months as compared to 7.1 months. So this slide uh, looks at those patients who relapse when they are transplant eligible and uh, what are the options we have if they have relapsed uh, uh, post-transplant, you have an EMED-based combination and then a, an, a proteasome inhibitor-based combination. And you have these PFS. Uh, I mean, the best is for daratumumab here, but you have to bear in mind that these patients were mostly learned mind naive. And I'm not sure if you will get the same PFS. In looking at the real world evidence, this does not happen as we have seen in the trial. IRD is an option uh, that has proven, uh, even in the real world evidence, to give more or less similar PFS. Other combinations you can use uh, uh, RD cyclo, uh, RCD, or uh, plus chemo. Now, the proteasome inhibitor uh, combinations, the KD as per the endivore giving a PSFS of 18.7, DARA VD, 27 months, and these are other options that uh, somebody can use in the uh, uh, relapse refractory setting. Um, I will go quickly over the trial that have focused on patients that are lenalidomide refractory, or they have pa patients that have relapsed uh, uh, while on lenalidomide, which I believe represents more the um, uh, actual status of the myeloma paradigm since many or almost all patients will be using a lenalidomide-based regimen if they were non-transplant eligible or uh, they will be on lenalidomide maintenance post-transplant if they were uh, transplant eligible. So the first is uh, the MM003, which is POMDEX, uh, giving a MUDIS. POMDEX POM was compared to high dose de uh, DEX in this trial. And all patients must have received two prior treatments, and all patients must have failed bautism and melanodomide. Very, uh, I mean, a difficult group uh, to treat. And in that uh, trial, these patients have gained uh, about two months as compared to high dose dex, four months versus 1.9 months, which is uh, uh, something modest if we compare it to others. Now, adding cyclophosphamide in this phase two trial to the POM dex has improved the, the regimen. And in this study, uh, actually, they have looked at uh, different arms, the most important of which are these two arms, arm B and arm C. Arm B is POM DEX, arm C is uh, POM CycloDEX. And uh, the, uh, I mean, that uh, the addition of Cyclo has improved PFS to 9.5 months as compared to 4.4 months when we have POM DEX. So, POM CycloDEX is a decent combination in that uh, group of patients, giving you a PFS of 9.5 months. Um, uh, the uh, OPTIMISM trial uh, uh, well, is uh, more recent, and it looked at uh, pomalidomide, uh, uh, pomalid PBD, pomalidomide, uh, belcade, and dexamethasone uh, compared to VD in, uh, uh, in these patients. And I want to show you the characteristics of these patients where um, uh, uh, the linalidomide, almost 100% uh, uh, of them, of these patients have used uh, linalidomide uh, in, in the prior therapy. Uh, and this represents what we uh, actually see uh, currently in real life. Uh, so the uh, uh, result of the trial, 11.2 months versus 7.1 months. So um, PVD, pomalidomide, uh, velcade, dexamethasone 
gives you uh, 11.2 months. So with all of these regimens, you get about a year or even less. More recently, is Ituximab, which is another uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, an anti-CD38, was combined uh, with pomalidomide and low-dose DEX in the ICARIA trial. <coughs> Uh, and that was compared to pomalidomide dexamethasone. If you remember the POMDEX, the MM03, uh, 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 um, showed uh, about 4.4 months uh, PFS. Uh, let's see how does the addition of isotoximab do. Again, if you look at these patients, uh, prior EMED, 100% of these patients used a prior EMET. So you get 11.5 months. And even the PD arm here, if we compare to the MM03, did even better that arm uh, than that arm in the MM03, telling you uh, this was uh, a robust selection of uh, these patients that uh, represent clinical refractory patients. The CANDOR study was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we saw it last ash, uh, presented by Saad Osmani in a late breaking abstract. Um, and that trial compared uh, Dara KD, Dara carfilzomib and dexamethasone, to carfilzomib and dexamethasone the, as, as uh, the way it was given in the endivore trial. And uh, in addition, uh, in the Dara arm, Dara Tumumab was added. So in that uh, uh, trial, the patient characteristics again, um, lenalidomide was given in about 40 to 50 percent of patients uh, uh, previously. Um, so the KR, KDD arm. Um, the uh, PFS was not reached in the KDD arm as compared to 15.8 months in the KD group, uh, which is more or less uh, acceptable comparator arm uh, as we compare it to the Castle trial. Um, more recently, uh, uh, in the last EHA, the isotuximab was uh, combined with carfilzomib and dexamethasone in the IKEMA trial. And in that trial, uh, isotuximab plus KD was compared to KD, and the, the uh, selection was 3 to 2, uh, uh, and the treatment was given until progression. Uh, prior proteasome inhibitor, almost 90 or 85 pay per, per percent of patients, prior EMEDs, uh, more than 75% in the ISA KD and more than 80% in the KDR. So quite represent a group that is really LEN refractory or uh, have used. And in that trial, again, ISA KD, if we compare it to DARA KD, um, it looks very good. Uh, promising, probably slightly better than the Dara KD, but um, I mean, uh, we cannot compare these trials. But again, uh, the uh, uh, PFS was not reached, and the comparator arm was also uh, shown, uh, showing good results of 19 months PFS. So, um, this is going to be my last slide. More uh, recently, we know that there are different regimen, different treatment modalities that are novel, mainly the uh, CAR T cells uh, and anti BCMA. The most, uh, I mean, uh, probably in addition to the CAR T cell therapy, is uh, a GSK molecule, which is uh, now called Bilantamab uh, Mafodotin. Uh, which is uh, an anti-BCMA conjugated with uh, 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 orostatin. Um, the problem uh, of that drug is that causes significant um, uh, keratopathy, and uh, 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 it, which can reach to blindness. Well, it's really uh, very new, and we have to. Uh, wait, uh, amgen molecule. We don't. Uh, we I don't have any uh, data on that, and uh, lots of CAR T cells are being used with uh, uh, variable success or response or response rate of more than eighty percent.
With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Dr. Hijazi, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, very hard and complex to navigate through all these options. I believe uh, I, I, I joined the hematology world like five years ago. It was much easier to treat myeloma 15 years ago, probably with two or three agents in hands. Right now you have seven to eight agents when the patient relapse, good for the patient, lots of hard decisions for the clinicians to make. Um, I'd like to thank you for, very, for the very rich uh, presentation um, right now, we'll uh, move on to, um, you know, look at some uh, survey questions uh, for the audience to uh, answer. Uh, please um, uh, read the question. It's on the, on the, on the screen. Uh, let me read it out loud. Uh, tell, tell us about the satisfaction, uh, uh, your satisfaction with the SSBMT webinar series. Uh, you have three options. I already clicked mine because I'm very satisfied. I'm not gonna skew you to do that, but just saying. Okay. We'll take a moment until we see the uh, results of the poll. Afterward, we'll uh, take some uh, questions and answers uh, for the uh, two speakers. Also, you can post your questions once we open the um, question and answer uh, session. Should we go ahead and uh, show the poll? Okay. Well, um, we will we will work hard to get to um, um, change the two persons who uh, don't like um, or less than fifty percent satisfied. But I'm glad to see that the majority actually is satisfied with the uh, with these webinars. Um, by the way, these webinars. This is the tenth um, webinar. Uh, the these webinars will carry through until December, which is a huge effort by our colleagues in the National Guard uh, Hospital and the SSBMT in particular uh, to arrange all of that. We're, we're going to be having every Saturday lecture. Um, uh, let's see if we have any other uh, questions. Um, Okay, we don't have any more polls. We'll move on to the question and answer mode. Um, for the audience, you can go ahead and post your questions. Uh, and uh, once you post your questions, we'll pick some of these questions for uh, um, the speakers to answer. Um, until we get more and more questions, well, they start filling up. Uh, we have at least three, four questions right now. Let me go ahead and start with asking Professor uh, Malo um, about KRD in the first line setting. Uh, for some time, for high risk patients, many clinicians uh, preferred to start with KRD as opposed to VRD. And now in light of the endurance clinical trial and uh, the data from the daratumumab uh, frontline uh, uh, use of uh, daratumumab, is there any role for KRD in high-risk patients in the first-line setting? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, the endurance study that was very uh, recently published in the Lancet Oncology and presented at ASCO compared prospectively KRD versus VRD without stem cell transplantation in patients with standard risk disease and not high risk. And I would say, disappointingly, KRD is not better than VRD. Uh, and the median PFS with a fixed duration of KRD, fixed same duration of KRD versus same duration of VRD, the median PFS is not outstanding. That's 34 months only, including a mixed patient population of young and elderly patients. And at the end of the day, when you are looking at the Lendex arm of Maya, only for elderly patients, the median PFS is 32 months with Lendex alone. So I can't believe that those results, to my opinion, are really poor looking at VRD versus KRD. So many bias into this study that is outstanding in terms of idea of, of number of patients, more than 1,000 patients. But, well, I would say that, well, K, VRD will, is here to stay. And, uh, but we also have some good data with KRD plus daratumumab or KRD plus izatuximab that were recently published as well. Uh, at ASCO, KRD is a tuximab, uh, six cycles, 
from the German study, 60% of MRD negativity in high risk patients. So I believe that VRD uh, is the winner, uh, but we cannot claim that KRD definitely is not a good option for high risk patients. Thank you for that. Um, the second question, I think uh, it, these are my questions uh, for um, uh, for the matter. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and take some questions from the audience. But the MRD, um, uh, the, the we've been hearing about MRD um, as as a, a strategy to follow up newly diagnosed patients um, very frequently lately. Um, do you think it's the prime time to incorporate that in clinical? Uh, uh, practice not in the um, in the clinical trials. Is it time to check MRD on every patient and how to, to do so? Uh, there is currently a very big effort from the uh, medical community, both from uh, cooperative groups and pharma companies uh, into the I-square team. We are looking at all trials, prospective phase three trials, frontline and the relapse setting with the uh, 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 thousands of patients and we are looking at MRD as a surrogate for PFS and OS and these, uh, those results will be submitted to FDA and EMA so that potentially uh, MRD uh, negativity uh, will be uh, accepted as an official uh, and regulatory uh, biomarker for approval of combinations. Uh, as soon as uh, we will have this uh, 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 job uh, validated by the authorities, we will be able to use uh, MRD outside clinical trials to uh, tailor our strategies and uh, to uh, monitor the patients. But that's not yet possible, uh, to my opinion, in the routine practice. That's not that we are doing, for example, in France. Excellent. Thank you very much. So it's not prime time for MRD, maybe waiting, awaiting some data yet. A uh, question for Dr. Al-Hijazi um, about the relapse of factory setting. Um, someone is asking uh, if the patient relapses after autologous stem cell transplant, a year after autologous stem cell transplant, uh, would you go ahead with a second transplant or move on to uh, a, um, a novel agent? Well, the guidelines specify 18 months of duration of remission post O2 to consider a second O2 as a treatment option. A year will be too short to, sh to consider O2 as a second treatment option. And I would uh, choose a, com uh, a combination that has not been used or the patient has not been refractory to. But uh, a second O2, I would not probably choose that as uh, a treatment regimen if the duration of remission was only one year. More than 18 months, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have many questions here. I think we have uh, still two minutes to go, so we can use this time. Um, yeah, the really um, hot topic in the past six months, uh, apart from CAR-T and multiple myeloma and daratumumab um, introduction in the uh, first line setting is lenalidomide in high high risk smoldering myeloma. I, I know that this is outside the scope of this lecture. However, any comment from uh, Professor uh, um, or or Dr. Hijazi? Well, we we have now uh, in smoldering myeloma the uh, Spanish study comparing Lendex versus no treatment, showing an overall survival benefit. And recently, uh, the ECOG study from Dr. Lonial showing also a PFS benefit uh, for, uh, for patients treated with lenalidomide. But I would say that we need really more data. There are ongoing trials looking at stem cell transplantation with, for high-risk smoldering. And we need those data before uh, indicating that we should treat high-risk smoldering systematically. The guidelines are not proposing uh, a systematic treatment for high-risk smoldering. Um, uh, we need to have more clinical uh, uh, results from clinical trials. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is this would be the last question, and um, we uh, like to um, inform the audience about the next week's um, activities. 
before we move on, we'd like again to thank our premier sponsor, Novartis, and uh, the platinum sponsor, Takeda, um, uh, for their sponsorship to these uh, webinars. Uh, for next week, uh, we're going to move on to have a um, a lecture about um, sickle cell disease, um, a very common topic, how to treat sickle cell disease uh, with recurrent VODs, uh, uh, VOCs, uh, by Dr. Julie Cantor of uh, University of Alabama. Please don't forget to tune your uh, reminders for next Saturday to attend this lecture. Thank you very much for attending this very rich lecture with information and uh, good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.